Hi, yes. Okay, so um, welcome everyone to the NetFilter mini workshop. So it's going to be me that is going to be talking all the time. So, well, I try to pull some people in during the discussions too. So, um, well, my name is Pablo, for those that don't know me. And I'm the, the NetFilter maintainer. So, I got to make a, a quick summary of um, what has happened in NetFilter in the last six months since the last NetDev conference. And then I will make also a summary of what has happened in the NetFilter workshop that we um, that we had just weeks ago in Germany. And also I'm going to make um, another pass on top of the flow table by pass support that was discussed in the previous conference but got merged upstream back in January. So it's been already a while and we got some changes on that front and some and also I'm going to take a bit of time on, on the RFC that um, Stephen and me sent as a joint work um, basically to combine the idea of the flow table with the GRO engine to, uh, um, to provide um, a new fast forwarding path. So, so what happened upstream in the meantime? So um, we got a we got a, a patch to speed up um, X tables rule set updates, basically using a new uh, locking approach. It's um, something that basically is improving performance for improving um, rules at low time for um, all the um, IP tables, uh, basically for IP tables, IP6 tables, EB tables, ARP tables, everyone that is using the X table interface. We also got lots of sanitization fixes. One of the things thing that didn't happen to to the X tables interface is that uh, by when it was written, um, it was supposed to be always behind the the cap net admin curtain, but that changed once we got um, all this infrastructure got leverage by um, by name and spaces, right? So uh, specifically user name and spaces. So now, um, I mean, basically we've been discovering uh, a long time, along the last the last years that there were not sufficient sufficient sanitization in that interface so we've got fixes to, to improve that situation many of the existing robots that are um, basically searching for um, creating foam blobs that are pushed into the kernel has been also helping a lot in that front so we also remove a defensive check that we have had in NetFilter actually since basically the beginning of it so it's code that has been there for almost 20 years and then it was checking for malform IP4 header, and that was not possible in, uh, anymore because since 2011 there is a patch that is basically not allowing to inject uh, malform IP4 packets from the from raw sockets. So it, it, it is code uh, code that used to be in the fast path, just a branch that is basically gone for all existing IP table table variants. Um, it's, there is also a speed ups in in terms of net namespace um, uh, release uh, in the, from the release path. Basically, there were there were lots of synchronized RCU calls there, and they are quite expensive. If you make several of them in a row, so now now they are gone, and this is quite quite faster. Um, we got segment routing for IPv6, and which is basically a, a new extension for for the IP for IPv6 tables. And um, there is a new feature that is allowing you to filter traffic before the fragmentation. So now you can load the raw table um, before the, the fragmentation engine. Traditionally, this has happened always after. So it's a module parameter that you can specify. So, so by when the AP table underscore raw module is loaded you can you can specify where where to to do the filter the filter where you want to do the filter so uh, in IPVS the main thing that happened is the maglet support that got contributed and 
In NF tables, we got uh, also a bunch of updates. Rule sets got uh, rule set updates got got the speed up also. Um, it's actually much faster now if you try with with latest latest kernel. Um, we got a new interface that allows you to um, to inquire the kernel to know if an element belongs to to a given set. So it's basically control plane code that was missing in the netlink interface that is now available. Also, the code for NF tables is there. So syntax is, looks a bit like NFT um, get element, and then you specify in between the curly braces what element you are searching for. Uh, we got timeout support for interval sets. That is a feature that has been missing for a bit. There are people building white blacklists um, based on intervals, and they were asking for this timeout support. So now it's already there. There is basic IPsec support. is still missing a, a few a few features that are needed by the users. They've been reporting that it's not still complete. So we will see another iteration on this support. The code limit support is already there too. So and I explain how what is the approach that we have followed, which is significantly different from what we have in IPTables. It's partially reusing the infrastructure that we have in AP tables, but it's slightly different. And we also got 60 bit, 64 bit handles to uniquely identify all objects that we create in NF tables. That is also interesting to identify, to make sure that you keep referring to the same object a long time. Connection tracking, we got um, we got a fix for a long standing problem. That is basically that um, connection tracking could drop packets that are racing to insert contract entries from the confirmation path. S and this problem is quite easy to trigger if you combine it with NFQ. <coughs> um, so basically what we are doing now is that from the NFQ path we have a routine that is going to check if one of the packets lost a race, it's going to trigger a, a read lookup and it's going to touch the, the, the contract the contract entry that actually won race and it's also going to undo the mangling that happened to the packet that lost race that needs to needs to be needs to happen otherwise uh, for example we may get a different source port that is not it's not going to work. It's going to break the flow. So that code is already upstream and it will show up in the next kernel release in the next kernel official release and then the the new flow table bypass infrastructure that, that I will describe in this presentation too so um, so we had an filter workshop quite recently just a few weeks ago in Berlin in Germany it was a meeting um, where the six core team people, basically the four active members and one of the emeritus, um, and 13 developers, contributors, we, we met together, we joined, and, and we were basically, we spent three days, several days in a row, um, discussing ongoing developments, main topics, as you could expect, were including quite a lot of talks about NF tables, Specifically, um, progress on the lib NF tables library, JSON support, the interaction with IP tables, and also some miscellaneous debate on on um, and how to how to improve integration with with Firewall DE and what was missing with regards to what IP set supports. Um, load balancing um, updates too, because we now we have a new user space software daemon that you can use to configure load balancing and a number of missing features specifically the, the con connection tracking f um, fine grain um, timeout time policy the code limit support and IPsec um, there were also updates on bridge net filter and, and the, the flow table bypass 
Um, so the libnf tables is is an effort that has been um, um, that has been leader by by Phil Suter. Um, it's available since nf tables 0 0.9.0 0 and it, the API is quite simple it's basically we, we are providing two, two, two new interfaces this nft run command from buffer so you just pass a buffer and this context object that I will just show you how it looks like and there is another variant that allows you to pass a file that you want to that you want to run that you want to load into the kernel so this is just basically providing a native interface for third party applications so we can start or stop telling people to use the the command line utilities that has been so far the main interface that we've been offering in in IP tables specifically we've been pointing to users to to use the IP tables restore uh command uh, and now hopefully we are going to have something better so what else? So basically, Phil he he created he uh, he added this these interfaces to um, to create to allocate the um, the contract the, the the context object and to release it. And this context object is going to be used to configure how you want the library to behave. So we wanted to offer a very simple API to start with. So this simple API, as you as you s could see, it's just taking a string in in NFT in NFT command line format. So and then if you want to modify the behavior you just use one of the setter or getter that we have to to um, to configure the context object. So for example if you want to run a if you want to make a dry run you just set that dry dry run flag on the context object and you just run the, the NFT command using the, 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 the native API or for example a strip of a strip of stateful information when listing for example in case you don't care about the existing counters or for example if in case of a quota object if you don't want to store or get in the listing how many bytes has, has been already consumed so um, so it's basically just removing all the stateful information from from the classic expressions objects that we have that are a story need internally. Um, you could also enable the debugging information. You could display the 64-bit handles that we have in all objects now, and lots of many other um, things that you could configure. But for most people, just creating the context object and then running commands through the, the API that I just shown, it should be should be should be fine. There is also a number of interfaces that allows you to, to decide what to do with the output and also with the errors that happen. So basically, you, so you can configure them to, to print the output to a buffer or also to a file descriptor. So And the, 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 the default behavior is to print that through the standard or the error um, using the, the standard output or the, the, the standard error output. Um, Phil also finished the JSON support, so also available since since the la latest release. Um, it comes with with listing and parsing support. I still missing monitor mode and tracing mode. The monitor mode is quite convenient in case you want to track rule set updates. It's a feature that has been missing in IP tables for a long time. Now it's available in NFT. So um, and there is also the tracing mode that is. Um, it's uh, it, it allows you to uh, to debug an existing rule set to, to see what what path the packet is following when evaluating the rule set. Uh, this tracing mode and monitor mode can be combined. They are working with uh, with existing tooling, but there is no way to express this in JSON yet. But it's just a matter of time. And then stabilizing the format that we had some discussions about some nitpick changes that may happen, but most likely it's already quite good and stable, so so we can just freeze it soon. It's just to show you how it looks a bit, this simple example. So in case you want to match the IP protocol field and you want to match any of these protocols, so it's 
the representations look like match and then then you express what you have on the le left hand side that is basically the key and then on your right hand side you're going to have values or sets and then in this example you have basically that you want to match a payload you're going to specify the protocol through the name field and then and, the, and through the yes through the name JSON field and then field for the for the packet field and um, as you can see there is no it's not that from the JSON high from the JSON representation for lib NF tables we don't we don't um, provide a low level interface I mean we don't provide offsets access to offsets to offset to base to so it's you are going to refer to um, to protocol to, to to fields that are available in 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 the headers so it's 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 an interface that, that is higher level than what we have what we offer in libnf table in libnftnl that is actually allowing you to do all that but it's it's something that is tricky and it's better if the user doesn't have to know because there are fields that are complicated like like let's say ip dscp so building an expression for that field is not so straightforward you have to end up doing bit shifts and so on so with with this api is is just we just you just specify what you need and you go and internally it's going to generate the expression um that is going to match what you what you want so um, and then at the end of it you have an action there is a null thing there that is basically because the um this action has no no parameters no no, no options so what else um there were we we had also miscellaneous discussions on nf tables and ip tables um um integration so basically here florian westphal he was uh pointing that it would be good to um if if we improve interaction between nf tables and ip tables so basically uh show show our way to the user make it make it easy to the user to identify that both tools are, are being used at the same time so just in case you have some software generating rules automatically and then you are typing rules by yourself and in case that for example this software is adding uh, is adding rules to IP tables um, while you are adding rules to NFT and and then things could go wrong because both policies could, could contradict each other and then things may not work and debugging all that without giving s providing some degree of visibility between the different tools is is actually quite convenient so um, the outcome from these discussions was to um, at least display a notice when when calling IP table safe or also when when listing the rule set in NFT to 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 make it to make it clear to the user to make it transparent to the user that that both tools are being mixed so just to make it easier for debugging it's something it's quite simple approach we we we, we discuss other approaches more complicated ones like for example taking the IP, the ip tables um binary blob and translating that into nft net in format and so on but all that is too complicated and it's going to take too much time so we, we decided to go for the simple the most simple approach by now and see and then wait for feedback to see how things go um, Florian proposed to rename the IP tables compact to, to X tables it seems that people don't like this compact thing it's it's not a nice name so now it's been renamed and there are more things that are actually happening also because it was very easy to um, to implement monitor mode for these X tables and to get events for free. So now we have an IP tables monitor X tables minus monitor tooling that you could use. So this compatibility layer is exactly is, is starting to do more things that that we envision originally. So actually, it's something that um, uh, the, all these ideas came. I mean, were were discussed already time ago, but because we were trying to give give preference to uh, to NFT to the new tooling, um, we just left them behind. But now we are 
probably resurrecting all this stuff. So, so now all this IP tables compat stuff got renamed, and um, we may see progress in um, implementing more native translations from from what what it used to be the IP tables compat to to native NF tables. So basically, the idea here is that. Um, at this stage, if you call IP tables compat or this new X tables command line tool, what it happens is that we are going to use the native NF tables engine, but we still rely on an extension in the kernel whose name is NFT underscore compat. And this NFT underscore compat is basically calling the X tables, the classic X tables matches and targets. But we could do slightly more. What we could do is that for um, simple matches, like all the existing protocol matches that we have, we could add a AD sector infrastructure that will allow us to basically route these matches to, to some user space extension that will translate that to a native matching on TCP. So, so bottom line is we could use more we could do more native representation and of of what we represent in X tables um, there is a regression test suite that suite that has been contributed by Arushi um, she sent uh, initial patches we, ha we have very 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 little tests so far um, but it's going to. We are going to make progress on that front too. It, it's something that was was missing. We we actually already had IP tables regre regression infrastructure. It's a Python based infrastructure. It's a script that basically just it takes commands and it's going to insert them into the kernel, and then it's going to check if the listing matches with what we inserted. So it's basically just exercising the the control the control plane, and but we 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 needed more sophisticated testing basically f specifically for IP tables restores and save there are lots of configurations there that you could use that you could combine and and those interactions are not so obvious and basically when we were testing the IP tables compat or now X tables uh, we were realizing that we realized that um, we, we really needed something that was going to um, to do more um, extensive testing on 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 all these combinations. So it's we are making programs on that front. In IP set, Joseph Kladesic, he was talking about he make he basically made a very very nice summary of what, what IP set supports already and um, comparing it to what we have in NF tables. So and. And what is basically left, I that is not much, is there is no um, there is no uh, way that we can combine set intervals or, or set with uh, prefix prefix elements with concatenations. So something like what you can see there on that example cannot is not supported. So and it seems that it's something that users has been asking for it for a while, and and now there is also Eric Garber. That is the firewall the maintainer that needs it. So it's something that Joseph mentioned during the conference that he will take a stop at it and and he will implement it. So basically, to achieve this this flexibility, it's not a set that is so performant because the data structure that we have to use uh, is going to take a bit of time to to find the matching. But it's it seems that people like it a lot, so we are going to support it anytime soon. There is another feature that is this force add. Uh, flag that is basically allowing you from dynamic sets to to uh, remove an element in case the set is full already so um, it's just basically removing the first element that you find in the in the in the bucket um, and there is another flag that is this no match flag that is basically inverting the matching criteria it's not going to work with the existing rb3 implementation that we have so we will need a new set backend to support this flag 
So and then Joseph will mention it that he was going to look at, have a look at, at the at supporting a tri tree matching, a tri tree tri tree data structure. Um, yes, and this no match flag needs to work too for um, the NFT get element command. So it's basically in case that you want to test from the from your control plane if an element belongs to a set for those people that are basically building a set and populating the set the sets with elements from the packet path if you want to check if that if a given element is in that set you could you, you sh we should be able to to also to invert the matching criteria and specify this no match thing so that's basically what is what is missing compared to NF tables Firewall D Eric Garber, as I said, he was making a presentation during the NetFilter workshop to to um, make comments on what was missing from the Firewall D perspective. Um, for those that are not familiar with Firewall D, is actually enabled by default in in several distributions. Uh, SUSE, Fedora, Red Hat, basically. Um, it's written in Python. It supports Dbus and so far it's, it's calling commands it's basically invoking the binary um, now it's fully it fully works the good news is that it's working fully with nf tables natively natively but also with the with what used to be the compact layer the neo x tables tool uh, there is ongoing work to use the native the the library that is now available that phil finished so anytime soon firewall is not going to be invoking commands anymore and then the requirements from Eric Garver were basically uh, the support for interval sets or prefix elements with uh, prefix elements with concatenations that I just mentioned and also he would like to see and um, he would like to see support for the NAT chain from the INET family that is something that should be easy to do um, Laura Garcia, she was talking about the demo that she quite recently released. Current version is 0 0.2. Um, this NFT LB is a user space demo that is that aims to provide an easy way to configure NF tables, the NF tables infrastructure, in in a in load balancing environments. So it performs health checks at different levels, like making sure that there is a neighbor entry route replies to ICMP are correct uh, reachability from from uh, layer 4 TCP also check for HTTP service working being available and there is a Debian package available now actually quite quite recently upstreamed um, this NFT load balancer Supports three modes. They call it uh, one of the no the mode is as source NAT, but it's actually m not just doing source NAT. It's actually doing masquerade plus D NAT. So it's emulating the proxy behavior. That seems to be something that system administrator DevOps are asking for sometimes. So there is also a D NAT mode that is just purely a destination NAT mode, and then there is a direct server return and soon there will be a new mode there will be support for a new mode that is the stateless dnat mode uh, all the infrastructure to support this in the kernel and nft is already available so it's a matter of adding the missing bits to user space so um, so basically the idea of this stateless nat is something that is going to sit in between the dnat the classic dnat mode and the, the direct server return uh, so it's slightly easier to set up than the DSR. It's less performance than the DSR mode, uh, but as I said, it's it's simpler. It's it's much easier to configure, and it, it's going to cause less less troubles in in case you do something wrong in your network. So some people some people have concerns about DSR regarding um, um, problems that may happen in the in the network if you don't configure it right so so they they prefer to go for something 
um, that is safer. So well, we, we will see this 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 mode soon too. Um, they are supporting four schedulers at this stage. It's one is weight based round robin hash and also sim symmetric hash hashing is available. The NFTLB daemon supports IPv4 and IPv6. It provides a REST API. And the configuration file is it, it's using JSON and it's coming also with an automated test infrastructure. So the configuration looks like this. So basically you have to define farms. You place a name on the farm and then you configure virtual address and ports. You configure also the load balancing mode that you want to use. Uh, for what protocol you want to apply the, the load balancing approach, also the scheduler, and then you have to specify the backends. And so basically, the IP4 the IP4 addresses of the backends, and in case weight is needed or priority, the state allows you to take to take up or down a given backend. You could also um, the priority for farms allows you to define to define a low, um, high availability scenario, so you could have a farm that is going to behave as a primary and you could define another farm that is going to act as a backup so if there is a problem in a farm you're going to fall back in a different farm to a different farm that is active that is going to be replacing the one that is failing so all that kind of flexibility that they want to have so how, what is what is happening from from NFT is exactly something like this so this NFT LB is generating rules and those rules look like this so you it's creating a map so this map with the TCP services is um, contains elements that are concatenations those concatenations are basically the tuple has the following components it's IP4 address then the service and a verdict and and then from the routing chain what we are going to do is that we are going to find a matching in the map and based on that we are going to apply the action and then when when going to the the vs1 chain from there we have the rule that is going to apply the the load balancing based on the hashing so the dnat chain below on the on the vs1 chain it's basically um, just hashing on the IPv4 source address it's applying modulus 2 and then based on that we are going to obtain the destination NAT that is going to be applied to the packet uh, this is this infrastructure is using the stateful NAT infrastructure that that we have in NetFilter. So this only applies to the first packet, and then followed by packets are mangled based on that on the NAT information that is configured that is stored in the connection tracking system. I mean the the rule set that 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 results from this is quite elegant in my in my opinion, and compared to. Um, um, to um, I mean, in trying to express this in IP tables is is possible, but the rule set is is not is not so nice. So, in case you want to support a new filter service, let's say we want to support um, HTTPS port for uh, port 443. So it's just a matter of adding a new element to the map and then just adding the chain that is going to do the load balancing between the new backend servers so it's so making incremental updates on this rule set is 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 quite natural actually all this is being generated by nftlb so it's not something that just it's just to show you what is what the daemon is doing Another topic during the NetFilter workshop was the cut limit support. So, um, for those that don't know about cut limit, it's an extension in IP tables that allows you to rate limit the number of connections per source or, or destination. Uh, you can also apply um, uh, net masks matching uh, rate limiting based on on a 
on a network, a specific network segment. But this, from time to time, there are users coming to the mailing list and asking for more matching criteria. So it's not that flexible. And extending support for this in IP tables is going to trigger more kernel code and it's going to blow the extension. So with well, when 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 looking into call limit and supporting this in NFT, we wanted to to provide the kind of flexibility that we have in NFT tables, so you could basically use any selector to apply the the rate limiting. That is basically the idea, and also combine it with concatenations and so on. So um, the, the the structure that we have in NXT call limit looks like it's a hash table, and then for each uh, know that we are going to find in the hash table there is an RB3 and then in the RB3 for each in each node we are going to find a linked list so the operation looks like we are going to hash the key and that is going to give us the RB3 and then we can we are going to perform the lookup on that key on the RB3 that we obtain and then we are going to get a list and then in that list we have a um, we have con nodes. This this con limit nodes are not are not contract objects, but they basically store the connection tracking tuple. So basically, the idea when when con limit was done was to avoid um, dependencies between direct dependencies with between the connection tracking and and con limit itself, and avoid ref reference counting and so on. So, um, and there is a garbage collector uh, that is going to run from the packet path that is going to remove the stale objects. Basically that garbage collector, what it's doing is that for each packet, it's going to um, look at for, um, for, the, for a matching call limit node, but if there is not, while, while uh, walking on, on the list, it's going to check for Con limits nodes are, are stale and it are uh, and they they are going to be removed. So this this approach of doing the garbage collection from 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 the packet path is because con limit is um, designed to uh, to overcome uh, scenarios where we have an attacker that is going to create many many many. Um, many 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 um, flows so the idea is to not to wait for a garbage collector from from user context to run just do that garbage collection from from the um, from the packet path so this is how call limit in the in next tables work so now then Florian he came up with the NF con count infrastructure so basically the idea was he just Place the code that is that could be shared between NF tables and IP tables. So the the original API was basically um, quite simple, just an initialize function that it was going to give us this um, hash table plus RB3 plus lists, and then a way to destroy that, and then a way to count just passing that data structure and a key and the tuple and the zone it was going to tell us this is the amount of connections that are actually matching this key criteria but then I extend that myself to support at least API so basically the idea is to um, just to extract the least data structure that we have because the goal was to reuse the existing NF table set infrastructure instead of um, instead of, instead of um, building in again these data structures that we already had in in, in a generic way in NF tables. So what I did is just it was just to take exactly what it what it was the bare minimum thing that we could that we could reuse. So this list, this API is allowing us to make lookups on the list to check for a given tuple that is matching city zone, and then this added flag is something that is going to signal us that um, that that entry was not found and that we can add it. There is the add interface that we can use to add new nodes, and and then the free 
it's going to just release the list so um, from the user plane from the NFT command line this looks like this um, basically um, we have a new extension that is NFT underscore con limit and this new extension is going to store just the list of con limit objects so no hash table no arbitrary so then you have to create a set then in case the criteria is going to be let's say um, the IPv the IPv4 address and then we are just going to um, refer to that set from the rule there is also in case I mean a very very simple way to use this would would be just to, to invoke CD count and then check if the if it's matching so if we are having more than two connections and then drop um, this is something that we don't support in IP tables but the uh, smart way and the way to 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 actually achieve exactly a um, mapping with what we have in IP tables is to combine it with with the meters or actually just dynamic dynamic sets so the idea would be to basically in the example there we are just matching new connections going to port 22 to SSH and then this meter XYZ is basically a set that is going to be dynamically populated from the packet path so based on the IPv4 source address for each IP new IPv4 source address we are going to add an entry into the XYZ set or meter as, as it is uh, as, uh, as it is in this example and then for each entry if the call limit counter goes over 2 then we are going just to count because of that counter expression that we have and then reject that connection so something to be done yet is something that we don't support in IP tables so basically with the call limit support in NFT we can do way more things than in IP tables we can just we can we can exactly mimic the 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 same behavior but we can also do fixed policies using the the object infrastructure so you can create a city counter object and this city counter object let's let's call it bad guy one uh, we are going to set a policy that is going to be over two and then also bad, bad guy two and set a policy of if connections go over six then match and then from the rule we are going to refer to this to these objects and we could use a map to quickly find what city counter objects is going to be applied so it's it's basically as you can read there is city count name and then based on the IPv4 address we are going to look up for the object that represents the the con limit policy so this is this is this syntax is, is is tentative so it's not yet implemented we can probably use nft add con limit instead of city counter or something like that um, so it's something that needs yet to be reviewed but the idea is the infrastructure is is already there in the kernel so it's just a matter of supporting it so as I said we could use any any key criteria to implement con, mat con limit so it's not that we have to stick to IP4 source or destination address something else is this harsher that has, has been working on this is another corner another feature that is missing in ftables that is defined grain timeout support so in IP tables we have the NFNet link city timeout infrastructure that in in that allows you to, to specify to specify timeout policies for connection tracking for a, a given a, a number of connections that are matching some criteria. So um, because sometimes the, the global the bo the global timeout policy that is available for connection tracking is not is not fitting well for what you need. So the work that she's done um, basically is to, to 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 add support for what we what was missing the kernel and then in the control plane we will have something like this so we will create city timeout objects and then you're going to set a name for the policy you're going to apply you have to restrict the policy to a given layer for protocol 
and then you can specify the timeouts if you don't if you don't uh, refer to any specific timeout we are going to use the default value so in this case we just define a policy one for TCP that is just going to reuse the existing timeouts but for establish or for thin weight are going to they are going to use different different values way way shorter so it's a way more aggressive timeout policy you could also define policy too and then again you can look up for the policy using maps very quickly so the city timeout that is going to be applied is going to be based on the IP, IPv4 source address and then we got we are going to take the the policy that, that that applies so we could we could not just use IPv4 source address but we could also use any concatenation any key that act is actually supported by NF tables so it's just very fast way to look up for policies and apply them there were discussions during the NetFilter workshop also about bridge NetFilter. I don't know if you're familiar with this, this piece of code, but it's a piece of code that is enabling interaction of IP tables with um, with the bridge layer. So basically, this infrastructure work, works like it follows. Um, one, you take a bridge packet. Then two, you, you turn it into something that looks like an IP packet. And by doing so, you have to, to attach the routing information. So it's, it, it is attaching a fake route, and then it's injecting it into the IP net filter hooks. So it was kind of a hack that was done at the time to provide transparent access to the IP tables features. So by the time this was written, IP tables was IP tables and IP6 tables were, were were already offering way way more features than than what EB table supports. So so this is kind of um software kind of glue code that was made to problem with this infrastructure is that there are a number of co corner cases that we are aware of that are not working exactly that is not working exactly the way the user is expecting so it's it it, it has its own problems it it requires a match a specific fifth step match that allows you to match the original um input or output interface for the packet given that for bridge packets the, 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 the input interface is going to be the bridge um, the, it's performing also header stripping like for example removing PPPoE that is something that it was not going to be fine for IP tables itself and um, so basically many of these discussions were about how to remove SKB NF bridge filled because we cannot use the control buffer because the packet is being reinjected when by when we reinject it into into the net filter hooks um, we could go we could just specifically for for local packets they could go into uh, the the real IP stack and it was going to override what we have in the control buffer so it's not the right area to use it so we, we we are not in full control on on the, on the control buffer. So another possibility that is what Florian is proposing is to to just to scratch one single bit in the escape buff, and then have keep a hash table to store this um, state information. Basically, this um, NF bridge info structure is just annotating all the mangling that we are doing in the packet to make it look like like native IP packet and then to restore bad things to make it to when reinjected reinjecting it back to the bridge so it's it's kind of a scratch pad area so the idea would be to place all this information in a hash table use the escape bath address to to perform the lookups another topic was the flow table bypass is something that is already upstream since January this year um, it's an idea that we already discussed in the previous conference but given that it's been upstream I think it's relevant to talk about it again and, and make a second pass to see to describe how it's how it is looking like so basically configuration is quite simple barely with one flow table object and then with one single rule you can specify what flows are going to follow this flow table bypass um, so there you define a flow table F and then that flow table F 
you have to specify where to hook it it's going to be at the ingress so far the only hook that we support for it and then priority allows you to in case that you have a filter chain in NF tables to filter traffic from ingress you could also place that chain before the flow table thing and then you have to speci specify what what uh, interfaces are going to be bound to to this flow table just ETH 0 and 1 simple configuration and then from the chain we are going to specify that TCP packets are going to be added to this flow table and that means that the connection tracking system is not going to be responsible for that flow anymore that's why we get this offload flag and then what it happens is that every time a packet kicks in from the ingress hook we are going to make a lookup at the flow table if there is an entry then we follow the fast path for the fast path we are just basically going to take the packet the flow table entry is storing is catching the route so we are going to touch the route to the packet and we are just going to push it out to the to the neighbor layer for tra for transmission so we are going we are going to bypass the classic forwarding path if the packet doesn't have an entry in the flow table it means that it is um, it is a packet that we we are seeing for first time or that we didn't confirm yet that we want to place in the flow table because because the rule that we specified to, to we we we, specif we used to specify what flows are placed in the flow table could use any matching criteria we could postpone adding the entry into the flow table after for example 10 packets or apply any any matching criteria actually so it's not that from the first packet this is going to apply right so so once for, for these packets that don't, don't follow the fast path they just follow the classic forwarding path so they go per routing the, we do the routing decision and then if, if it's not for us we go forward and then for the forward chain is where we can place this flow offload action so the flow of flow offload action has been done in a way that the, so so the the, the sys admin is aware that only flows that are being forward can be placed into the flow table right so because locally generated traffic needs to follow the classic path so so that's how it looks like this is just a verbose explanation of that so that for each packet we extract a tuple we perform the lookup if there is a mist we follow the classic forwarding path and if there is a hit we attach the route and then if the packet is over MTU then needs suspicion handling so it needs to follow a slow path um, the flow table infrastructure I forgot to mention but it integrates with with the NAT infrastructure so um, we are going to apply from the flow table path in that mangling that needs to be done also TTL is going to be decremented and then we just send the packet through through neighbor XMIT there is a garbage collector that is uh, removing flow table entries for which we, we haven't seen uh, packets for a while but there is also in the case of TCP there is a mechanism that allows us to 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 give back control to the connection tracking system that is basically for TCP reset and thin packets we pass them we pass them up to, to classic forwarding path again um, so so we can again reevaluate what to do with it in software just a pure flow table approach it, it was uh, it, it is already reporting um, better number it is close to three times faster than the classic forwarding path uh, I was using one of the scripts that is in in the kernel tree one single CPU and a smallest packet size and uses PKT gen so it's already significantly faster and then there is another topic that is the hardware offload support so um, uh, um, Nick switches uh, they are coming with with um, um, tables with infrastructures that allows us to define um, fast forwarding paths so packets are not passed to the, to the CPU to the host right 
So um, the idea is to add infrastructure to 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 in that integrates to the flow table, to the flow table software presentation. So, so we can just by enabling uh, one flag, we can we can specify, we can we can inquire, we can tell the kernel to to use the the um, hardware offload support if it's available in this in the given piece of hardware. So. So if in case know that in case that the hardware doesn't come with support for hardware offload from the control plane, we are g the, 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 we are just going to reject that. We are going to say no, we don't support this. What we can do is software only. So we have the software only mode, and if if the hardware supports it through this offload flag, we are going to turn on, and then packets are not going to only a few packets are going to follow the the software path, and then follow up packets with they will follow as soon as we configure the the hardware offload facility they will follow the the hardware path so they are not going to be seen by the host um, this infrastructure also is uh, can can be mixed with it seems that with with um, typical uh, routers with wireless and switch chipsets that um, That provide an, a facility that allows allows us to inject packets in what they call some in, in the in the transmit transmit path. It's it's just a way to so so both chipsets can interact each, each other. It's something that can be supported also with this infrastructure. So and there is there there are a number of vendors already interested in this. The, the infrastructure is quite small. It's only 200 lines of code. The generic hardware offload infrastructure and then the needed code from the driver side that's all so um, yeah. so hopefully we, we will we will get a client for this code soon so we can upstream it we need also either one new NDO hook or we could reuse the existing TC setup uh, hook for it so I spent um, a significant amount of time talking to to Giri Pirko and also to to other um, switch maintainers. And outcome of that discussion was that it would be good to have one single entry point. And so probably we will see soon patches on in the in that direction on the mailing list. Yes, and another derivative work um, related to the flow table infrastructure is a patch set that was sent just weeks ago um, that is providing a new fast forwarding path. So basically the idea is to do to do the lookup even earlier and um, so not at ingress but from from the GRO layer so it's way before the taps and overall idea is to avoid reiterative routing lookups and combine it with the GRO engine so we could do batching just basically the idea is to create a chain of SK buffs and then um, pass this chain to the neighbor X meet path so this this chain of SK buffs is something that the classic forwarding path that doesn't doesn't cannot cannot handle it. We we will, need, we will need to make way more changes to the classic forwarding path to 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 get advantage from this new representation. So but to keep so to keep it simple given that this chain of packets was um, was going to trigger lots of changes for the classic forwarding path we just considered that they were just going to follow the neighbor Smith path and classic forwarding path is not going to see them so and then in case that there is no matching there is no entry in the flow table what we do is we just follow the slow path that is just pass the packet to the generic uh, GRO handler so um, configuration is as I said quite simple is the only change is that you have to specify this new early ingress hook and then from the policy on the forward chain, you are going to specify what flows are placed into into the flow table, and then Stephen um, was collecting some numbers in his testbed, test 
So basically, the the the, the this new fast forwarding path was performing faster than TCP with TSO. Thing is that um, this chain of packets we cannot the driver cannot use TSO because it's it would need it would need actually Euro hardware support to to take advantage advantage from this new representation. So well, basically it was slightly just slightly faster than TSO. But for for UDP we really get better numbers. So it's um, it's more than double, right? And and also an, a significant improvement for for ESP. So when combining this infrastructure with IP sets, also with IPsec, also things were going faster. So yeah, Stephen, you're here, and in case you want to say anything. Yeah, so that's it. Um, yes, there are there are recent patches from Edward Cree that um, are following a slight a slightly different approach. So basically, he's adding new infrastructure to instead of using the GRO ledger, it's just new infrastructure that allows us to to build this chain of SK buffs, and we can probably explore um, rewriting this this bat set on top of that and yes this is all what I have so in case you have any question the mic did you check the your patches uh, after applying uh, Edward Edwards Cree uh, patch that improves uh, performance with the lists and the UDP segmentation oh. patch. No, we didn't. Not yet. No, yeah, not yet. Yes. Yeah. So idea, the idea is to have a look at what Edward has done and see if we can combine this patch set with his idea with this with new infrastructure that he's providing. Hi, Rashid Khan at Red Hat. So for the connection tracking offload with hard hardware offload, it's been more than a year since it's been percolating on the side and you presented that um, you're waiting for the drivers and the hardware vendors are waiting on you. So it seems to be like a log jam or a contentious issue. So how do we move along? How, how can we work together to make it accelerate and have it offloaded? Because all the OBS offload is not working right now because every single OpenStack use case and OVN use case needs connection tracking. Mm -hmm. So all that good work is there in place. It's part of the distributions, but without connection tracking, it all goes to the software path. So how do we accelerate this? How do we get to the next step? Yeah, that's a very good question. I mean, I mean, so far it's the process seems to be the process is rather slow. Um, I mean, actually a bit disappointed with with the pace but it's 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 going to happen at some point and hopefully I mean I, I've been receiving private emails from from many hardware vendors that are making progress and hopefully we will get a driver anytime soon I was expecting to get this faster really but yeah I mean, it's not something that depends on me but I mean I'm just doing all, all what I can all the best to 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 speed it up. So I, I will be very, very glad to see a driver soon. Hi, uh, Ronnie from Mellanox. So we are working on that. Uh, I think in the net filter you met uh, the two guys from, uh, three guys from Mellanox that's working on that. Um, we having now a POC internally that is using your code and, and TC together in order to have an obvious offload for that. And of course, uh, when we have some uh, RFC code that we can share, we will share it, and, and we want to have it. Uh, as as uh, he said, Reddit said, we want to have the idea is to have an OVS offload that can do the connection tracking and do a hardware offload for that. So we, we, we see it from a lot of customers that that's what we need, and that's what we're doing. Yeah, that's great. I mean, and So I, I hope at the end of the year, Hopefully we can get it in. Yeah. That's great. Yes, yes, yes. I got I got feedback also from um, from OpenWRT 
and they are working on a dif on a different segment in the in the hardware market with with smaller uh, smaller chipsets, and they seem to be also making progress. They told me, so hopefully we can we can get one of these drivers will soon land in the tree, and so we can justify inclusion of this new hardware um, infrastructure, this generic infrastructure to support hardware offload into the kernel. Because without without a client, it's not justified. I mean, the the software speed up is was was good enough to to justify the software infrastructure itself. But to go a step further, we need a client to. I mean, to, to get the hardware offload infrastructure, we obviously need a client. Another question we got connection tracking. Do we have some testing of performance of how many flow we can create uh, in a second? Because we also start with the OVS uh, that's working through TC to add rules. And then we understand that's OK, we're talking about a lot of rules. When we talk a lot, it's mean millions. and when everything was in the software, so the numbers was low because the performance was low. When we take it down to the hardware, when we talk about a, a hundred gig NIC, and we can process more than 20 million packets per second inside the hardware, so all the numbers are going up and the number of flows is going up. So do we have some benchmark or things that are done for connection tracking? That's, we know how, what is the maximum number, the, the, do you have some tests in that area? I got reports from people that have uh, have been evaluating it, and they report millions of entries per second. So. Okay, so it's good news. Yeah. Because when we start to work with TC, we understand that TC didn't scale well hmm. with number of, uh, of million rules. So now we do uh, some fixes there in order to to improve it. So. Yes, I think I think. Yes, I think the main main concern so far is um, is having the driver in, so we can we can start collecting numbers and also measuring uh, what is the magnitude of the boost that the hardware offload is going to provide, and and so on. But the software plane so far, um, I mean, it's it's fine and the numbers we that I got reported is they are also good enough so I don't think I would I don't expect a bottleneck on that on that okay front. so, so uh, numbers of millions is not something that uh, is new to you it's something that's worked in the past yes okay so good news yes if you have any other question Hello, uh, question about the flow table mechanism. I wonder, is it uh, that currently it's used only for forwarding packets, right? But would it be usable as a generic kind of offload mechanism? For example, if packets traverse like SDN uh, architect, uh, uh, like SDN interfaces inside the, st the network stack, for example, then, in then subsequent packets that, for example, go to a specific Mac villain can go directly there using the flow table. Would it be like relevant? Yes. So you mean you mean to store more information on the flow table on actions or what to do with the packet, right? So we just get the packet and then we do the VLAN and we push it out, or th things like that. Like stuff like that, for example. Yes. Or, for example, if the packet is lo locally destined but still, um, we would. Avoid all the, for example, if it's a Mac VLAN, then we would avoid the hash table lookup. Yes. We would just go directly to the Mac yes. VLAN. Yes, that should be possible. I think um, this is basically this is basically going in the in the direction of there is a very old RFC from Rusty Russell. Mm -hmm. It's probably more than ten years old, and he was proposing something like the ground unified f um, flow catch. Um, and it's mm -hmm. basically going in in the in what is basically describing what what you what you're telling. So it's just accumulate all actions, all things that need to be done on the packet. Just do one lookup mm -hmm. and then push it out to the destination to the interface where, where that you need. So mm -hmm. yes, I think I think this could be extended to to achieve all that kind of flexibility. 
and also it would be interesting to explore what hardware can do because the more things we can map to hardware we can the more we can consider extensions of that infrastructure to 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 enable those fast paths with 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 the, the flexibility that we need So regarding hardware, we say we can, we know that hardware can do it. That's we're already in today doing with the it's that with the TC infrastructure. And of course, uh, now I think this is a good place. That's it's coming from the connection tracking uh, that we will have a single NDO, so hardware offload. Uh, then we can, from the hardware perspective, the driver uh, we will have a single interface that configure everything. So it's can be work the same. So all those all those requests to, to have an open flow uh, infrastructure to the driver uh, will be a single interface because today we are supporting uh, OVS offload that is also kind of uh, open flow and we are today we're going through TC to do that uh, to make it uh, to take it to the hardware but of course net filter uh, NFT it's from our the same so we just need to have an API that's we'll call. Yeah, definitely. Any other question? Something to discuss? Yeah, I would like to say thanks to Melanox for offering me some NICs that will allow me to test this infrastructure when we, once we get the driver and also um, I have received hardware from other vendors. Um, so I, I'm always glad to receive any piece of hardware that can potentially um, um, can potentially be used to that can potentially be extended to support to support these offloads. So um, so just let me know in case that you have something that I can have a look. So it's always good when designing infrastructure to know what hardware can do so we c we just keep an eye on on implementing things in a way that that envisions that already cover the use cases that we are going to need so just let me know okay thank you very much